Some years ago, a certain Mr. Marsh learned that his aunt had died and included him in her will. The will read, To my beloved Stephen Marsh, I bequeath my family Bible and all it contains, along with the residue of my estate. Well, after the debts were paid off, only a few hundred dollars of the estate remained. That money was soon gone, and all Mr. Marsh had left was the family Bible which he put in a trunk in the attic. Stephen Marsh had to retire on a small pension. He lived in poverty for some 30 years. Finally, in his 90s, he decided to move into his son's home. While packing his belongings, he ran across his aunt's Bible and began leafing through it. Mr. Marsh was astonished to find banknotes scattered through its pages. He counted more than $5,000 in cash, a very large sum at that time. The man had spent most of his life in poverty when he could have been rich. There was a treasure right at his fingertips in the Word of God. Is it possible that we too have an amazing treasure right at our fingertips? There are millions who believe that the Bible is the most incredible book ever written. They are convinced the Bible is inspired by God and contains clear instructions on how to receive eternal life. People of every nationality, language group, and ethnic background have accepted God's Word as a life-changing, precious treasure. Others have serious doubts. They have a lot of questions. Can it be trusted? Is it accurate? Some say you can trust the Bible implicitly. Others say you can't. Who is right? And the answer is important. Because if the Bible is true, then whether or not you trust it is a matter of life and death. If the Bible is true, your whole eternal destiny depends on whether you believe and accept it. And what you believe about the Bible directly influences what you believe about God. So let's take a look at this great book, the Bible, also called God's Word, and see if we can find evidence as to whether it is true or not, whether it can be trusted or not. The Bible is really not just one book, but a whole library of books inside one cover. The Bible contains 66 books written at different times by different authors over a period of 1,600 years. There are 39 books in the Old Testament and 27 books in the New Testament. 45 different men wrote these books, yet we find among them an amazing agreement that can only be explained by the fact that they had a common source. This total agreement resulted even though most of the writers of these books never saw each other. They were from various occupations. Some were fishermen, some shepherds, some kings, some government leaders, some farmers, some preachers, some statesmen, a physician, men from all walks of life. Yet, there is perfect unity and harmony among the books they wrote. A miracle indeed. This agreement can only be explained by acknowledging that God gave this book to us so that He might be able to communicate His will to us. Peter wrote, For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21 The Apostle Paul wrote, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good to work. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 The reason God chose this method of communication, speaking to us in written form, is that face-to-face -face communication between himself and man had been cut off by sin. When God and man walked and talked together in Eden, there was no need to have a prophet Write down what God wanted man to know. When Adam sinned, he hid from God, for he was fearful and guilty about what he had done. When God asked Adam where he was, Adam replied, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid, and I hid myself. We can find it in Genesis chapter 3 verse 10. No longer could God continue to talk face to face. He chose to reveal what he wanted us to know through his prophets and later through his son.
Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. Amos chapter 3 verse 7. God inspired Moses to write the book of Job and the first five books of the Old Testament, which together are called the law. This was sometime around 1500 BC. At this time, Israel had grown to a mighty nation of several million people and God needed to be able to communicate His will in written form. The people would now be able to read the Ten Commandments that God wrote with His own finger and the book of the law that Moses wrote under inspiration from God. But the question still remains, is the Bible still accurate and dependable? Until the year 1947, the earliest manuscripts we had of the Old Testament were copies from around AD 900. But then a little Bedouin shepherd boy discovered a cave containing ancient leather scrolls preserved in clay pots, which led to the discovery of many more similar caves and hundreds of hand-copied portions of the Bible's Old Testament. The Isaiah scroll found there went back all the way to 125 BC. It had been copied over a thousand years before the oldest manuscript that had been found up to that time. It contained the entire book of Isaiah. Sir Frederick Kenyon, one of the most qualified experts and president of the British School of Archaeology, reported that in one chapter of 166 words, there is only one word, three letters, in question after a thousand years of transmission, and this word does not significantly change the meaning of the message. He continues, The Christian can take the whole Bible in his hand and say without fear or hesitation that he holds in his hands the true word of God, handed down without essential loss from generation to generation throughout the centuries. Sir Kenyon made this statement after spending a lifetime examining the evidence of how the Bible was transmitted and what effect that transmission had on the message of the book. The Bible critics of a century ago had found many reasons to raise doubts about the Bible, but many of these criticisms have been silenced by the shovel of the archaeologists. Until the 19th century, little was known about the ancient past except for what the Bible had to say about it. Ancient history seemed locked forever behind the strange picture writings, the hieroglyphics of Egypt, for no one in Egypt or in the whole world could decipher them. Then, in 1798, Napoleon led a military expedition into Egypt. With his 38,000 soldiers, Napoleon took a hundred artists, language experts, and scientists to help him better understand the history of that intriguing land. Everywhere they saw relics of the past and readable inscriptions, decorated monuments and temple walls. Napoleon and his scholars wondered what ancient messages those picture writings contained. Little did they know the secrets of the hieroglyphics were about to be unsealed. One of Napoleon's soldiers unearthed what became known as the Rosetta Stone, a black stone four feet long and two and a half feet wide. The Rosetta Stone is now housed in the British Museum, treasured for the role it played in unlocking the mysteries of the hieroglyphics and revealing secrets hidden for centuries. This rock slab, uncovered near the delta town of Rosita, bore an ancient decree in three different scripts. Hieroglyphic, which could be described as picture writing, Demotic Egyptian, and Greek. Of course, scholars could easily translate the Greek text, but the hieroglyphics were not understandable. However, 20 years later, in 1822, a brilliant young Frenchman by the name of Jean startled the world by deciphering the hieroglyphics on the Rosetta Stone. Thus, the vast treasures of Egypt's ancient past were opened to the scholars of the world. But the most important, the long-forgotten history of Egypt now told stories and gave evidence that confirmed scripture. The stones cried out that what the Bible had said was true. The more archaeologists continue to dig, the more evidence they find to confirm Bible history with historical records of past civilizations. Recent discoveries at Tel Marduk have electrified the world of archaeology. 
This city was called Ibla in Syria and was once a rich and sophisticated society of almost 300,000 people. Not since the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls have so many scholars in this field of study been so excited about the find. But it is even more exciting to the students of the Bible. In a scribal school adjoining the city's palace, 14,000 inscribed clay tablets and fragments were found, dating back at least 2,300 B.C. The world's oldest discovered government archive contained the official records of the kingdom of Ibla for more than a century. Some historians had questioned whether the Hebrews could have developed the art of writing by the time of Moses. Until the 19th century, no historical evidence existed to verify that. However, the Ibla tablets and other finds date back far beyond the lifetime of Moses. In fact, archaeologists have discovered whole libraries that date back centuries before Moses. The Ibla tablets refer to a creation story and a flood story. Also mentioned are names and places which coincide with biblical ones. Esau, Abraham, Israel, Sinai, even Jerusalem. But the real surprise is the mention of the two sin cities, Sodom and Gomorrah. Before the discovery of these tablets, no historical reference to these cities have been known except in the Bible. Therefore, they were considered to be just mythical places. Some authors will have to admit that Genesis is more than just ancient shepherd songs and legends. The discoveries at Ibla and elsewhere have confirmed the historicity of the Bible. David said, Thy word is true from the beginning. Psalm 119-160 Civilizations long dead are speaking from their dusty graves, confirming the accuracy and reliability of God's word. Until the 19th century, some scholars believed that Queen Semiramis built Babylon. Yet in the Bible, Daniel quoted King Nebuchadnezzar as saying, is not this great Babylon that I have built? Daniel chapter 4 verse 30. Who was right? In 1899, Robert Caldeway began excavating the old ruins of Babylon, unearthing tens of thousands of kin-baked bricks, all bearing the stamp of King Nebuchadnezzar, all taken from the walls and temples of the city. A cuneiform tablet recounting Nebuchadnezzar's achievements was also found by the archaeologists of Babylon. On it, the king had said, The fortifications of Isagila and Babylon, I strengthened and established the name of my reign forever. The Bible states that proud Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? Daniel chapter 4 verse 30. The East India House inscription, now in London, devotes six columns of Babylonian writing to a description of the huge building projects of Nebuchadnezzar. The spade again stood by the word of God. And we shouldn't be surprised. God says in Isaiah chapter 45 verse 19, I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. Another mystery of secular history was the absence of Belshazzar as a ruler of Babylon. The Bible named Belshazzar as the ruler of Babylon who witnessed the handwriting on the wall of the banquet hall. Was he only the invention of Daniel's fertile mind? Not at all. Nabonidus, a successor of the great Nebuchadnezzar, had entrusted the kingship to his son Belshazzar while he was away at Tima in Arabia for ten years. Tablets from archaeologists' finds state that the kingdom was indeed entrusted to Belshazzar, the crown prince, here is what was written. And as to Belshazzar, the exalted son, the offspring of my body, do thou place the adoration of the great deity in his heart. May he not give way to sin. May he be satisfied with life's abundance. And may reverence for the great divinity dwell in the heart of Belshazzar, my firstborn favorite son. It's found in God Speaks to Modern Man, Page 154. Isn't it interesting that in the closing chapter of Daniel we read, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Daniel chapter 12 verse 4. Knowledge would be increased not only in the scientific world, 
but also pertaining to the accuracy of God's word. Bricks and cylinders, tablets and manuscripts dug up by archaeologists are proving that what the Bible says is true. However, another compelling evidence that the Bible is God's inspired word is its ability to accurately foretell the future. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done. Isaiah chapter 46 verses 9 and 10. Yes, as God pulls back the curtain of time, giving us a glimpse of the future, He demonstrates to the world that the Bible is not just a book, it is His book. Before Babylon reached the height of its power and glory, God's book foretold its fall. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees' excellency, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Isaiah chapter 13, 19. The Bible even foretold the power that would overthrow his mighty kingdom. The Lord hath raised up the spirit of the kings of the Medes, for his device is against Babylon to destroy it. Jeremiah chapter 51 verse 11. The name of the man who would lead the armies against Babylon was prophesied 150 years before his birth, as was the very way he would do it. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, I will open before him the two lived gates. Isaiah chapter 45 verse 1. Were the prophecies of the Bible fulfilled? Yes, to the very letter. In the Persian Hall of the British Museum stands the Cyrus Cylinder, discovered in the ruins of Babylon. On this clay cylinder, Cyrus tells of his conquest. The details are accurate. The Bible not only foretold Babylon's destruction, it further stated, And Babylon shall become heaps. Jeremiah chapter 51 verse 37. Isaiah wrote, It shall never be inhabited, but wild beasts of the desert shall lie there and owls shall dwell there. Isaiah chapter 13, verses 20 and 21. God could foresee the future and predict so accurately the fate of the mighty Babylon. The explorer, Austin H. Lyard, describes the sites of ancient Babylon. Shapeless heaps of rubbish cover for many an acre the face of the land, a naked and hideous waste. Owls start from the scanty thickets, and the foul jackal skulks through the furrows. Discoveries among the ruins of Nineveh and Babylon, page 413. Of Babylon's former glory, nothing remains but its name on a signpost at the roadside in what is modern-day Iraq. The vast heaps scattered over the ancient Babylonian ruins are certain evidence to the inspiration and integrity of the Bible. We can agree with the prophet, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but uh, the word of our God shall stand forever. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 8. And friend, if God can precisely foretell centuries in advance the future of ancient kingdoms, can we doubt for a moment his ability and wisdom to predict accurately what our future holds for us? Hardly. The Bible is more than just reliable history, more than accurate scientific facts, more than prophecies fulfilled. If it were not, it would not matter what man did with it. The theme of the book, the heart of it all, is the account of what happened on a rugged hill outside of Jerusalem more than 19 centuries ago. And it makes a difference what we believe about that. Either the Son of the Living God died on that cross, or He did not. Either He was who the Bible says He was, or He was not. Was Calvary fantasy or fact? It makes a difference. And we need to know. Perhaps the greatest evidence that the Bible is what it claims to be is the power in the book to change lives. That power is wrapped up in one person, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. John chapter 5 verse 39. Jesus was speaking of the Old Testament, for the New Testament had not yet been written. As you turn the pages of the Old Testament, you will discover that they prophesy of a coming Messiah and tell of his mission of love and salvation. Jesus told his disciples, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets 
and the Psalms concerning me. Luke chapter 24, verse 44. The Old Testament prophesied of Christ, and the New Testament is his life story. So you see, the entire Bible is a revelation of Jesus Christ, who came to demonstrate to a planet in rebellion what his father was really like. That is why the Bible is called the living word of God. It carries an amazing power with it wherever it goes. A power that changes lives, transforms human character, gives strength to the weak, courage to the depressed, and hope to the dying. All through history, the power of the Bible to change people has been proven over and over. Angry people have been changed into peaceful people through the power of the Bible. Lastful, immoral people have become pure and clean. Drunkards have been delivered from their drinking, thieves from their stealing, cheaters from their cheating. You don't have to look far today to find hardened murderers in prison who have been changed into rejoicing Christians through the power of the Bible. You don't have to look far to find marriages that were heated straight for divorce that have been saved and filled with new love through the power of the Bible. No one can read the Bible faithfully every day without God's book changing him or her. And if you spend time each day reading the Bible, my friend, it will change you too. Jesus spends his time changing people. That is the heart of the Christian religion. And it is the heart of the Bible, the secret of its power. Jesus knew what power it was that changed man. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John chapter 8 verse 32. It is truth that sets men free, that changes men. It is the truth that makes a drunkard a sober and loving father. It is truth that frees the drug abuser. It is the truth that transforms tempers and gives integrity and purpose in the life. Millions of lives have been changed as people have studied the Bible. No greater power exists in the world to touch hearts and change lives. But God's word can change only those willing to be changed, those willing to accept the man in the book, Jesus Christ. You see, friend, it makes a difference what we do with the book. It is more than just a book to carry to church or to display in our homes. It is more than helpful information or useful advice. It is God speaking to our hearts. It is his love letter to his children on planet Earth. In it is the secret of survival everlasting happiness, and peace of mind. Let me tell you a story of the power of God's word to change lives. Many years ago, there was a ship called the Bounty. In 1790, Captain Bly and his crew started out from England to bring a load of breadfruit tree plants to transplant in the West Indies as cheap food for slaves. Because of Bly's cruel leadership and mistreatment of his crew, there was a mutiny, and Fletcher Christian the leader of the mutiny set Bly and eighteen of the crew adrift in a small boat. They managed to find their way back to England because of the expert ability of Captain Bly to navigate. The crew on the bounty didn't fare very well, but they ended up on the uninhabited Pitcairn Island. They burned the bounty so they could not be traced. When they had been in Tahiti, Bly had taken on board a number of women and children and a few native men. Trouble followed the mutineers as they learned to make liquor. There were murders and crimes, and before long, there was only one man, John Adams, and a number of women and children. John Adams sought until he found the bounty's Bible, which had been stored away in a chest. He started reading it, and as he did so, a tremendous change came over him. He realized that a tremendous responsibility had come to him to provide a future for these children. He began to educate them on how to read and write and how to live. The amazing transformation in the entire population of the island attracted the attention of passing vessels, then the British government, and finally the whole world. This Bible can change your life too, my friend. When we read the Bible, the same Holy Spirit which inspired the Bible writers to write down God's word centuries ago transforms our lives as we study it. It is our privilege to study God's word with an open mind and in simple faith say, O oh Lord, show me your truth and I will follow it. Reveal any changes I need to make in my life 
and I will choose to make them. Today, there is no more important decision you and I can make than that of submitting our hearts and lives to the authority of God's living word. I will be sharing to you a card just now that will give us the opportunity to join together in committing to studying and following the Word of God. The Word of God is the only thing sure in this very uncertain world. It points us to an unchanging God who wants a deeper relationship with us. It points us to the way of life, the way of salvation, and tells us where we came from and what our destiny can be. I invite you to read this card and simply comment below those sentiments you want to make today. The first option that you can prayerfully consider, if you find it accurate for you, says, It is clear to me that the Bible is God's inspired word. If that has been clear to you as we have studied, just write clear in the comment below. The second option is a decision, an important one. I choose to commit to live my life by the principles of God's Word. If it's your desire to live your life by the only unchanging standard of truth, then indicate by writing standard in your comments below. For many of us, if we are honest with ourselves, there are some things in our lives that just need to change. Let's read the third option. I surrender to Jesus anything in my life which is not in harmony with God's Word. Maybe the Holy Spirit has been convicting you of some sin, some habit, some practice that you know is not in harmony with the Word of God. Just let go and give it to Jesus right now. If you'd like to make this decision, indicate by writing harmony in your comments below. And finally, if you would like more information about the Bible, let us know by writing Bible in your comments. I'd like more information about the Bible. Of course, our seminars are designed for people of all faiths or of no faith. As a presenter, it sometimes helps me if I know where you're coming from. So if it's okay, just indicate by writing for me your religious persuasion in the comment below. We want to pray together and pray about the decisions we've just made. I'm going to pray for you, especially for those who may be struggling with the decisions that the Word has brought today. Let's just bow our heads as we pray. Father in heaven, thank you for communicating your will to us through this wonderful book, the Bible. Thank you for giving us Jesus to help us understand how we can live by your Word and for giving us the Holy Spirit to apply it to our hearts. Today, we've made some decisions. We've made the decision that we want to follow your word even when it calls for us to change our ideas, our habits, practices. Today, I want to thank you for those who have been convicted of specific things that your Holy Spirit is calling for them to change their lives. Give them peace as they do your will. Give them strength to be faithful to their decision. Change our lives. Make them anew through the power that is in your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.